Hello, everybody. Welcome to <laughs> the Magic of Podcast with Paul Rothman. And I have a very special guest today. Uh, not only a, a, a wonderful, wonderful actor, and uh, well, he's many things now. He's a very versatile, versatile young man. <laughs> but uh, he's a really good friend of mine. I would say one of my closest friends in LA. Uh, one of the first people that I, well, yeah, pretty much one of the first people that I met when I first arrived in L.A. in 2010 and uh, on this crazy journey that it's become. And so here he is with his full title, Mr. Craig Robert Young. Hello, Craig. <laughs> hey, Paul. How are you, buddy? I'm very good. I'm very good. So um, how is life treating you? <laughs> 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 I mean, I wish every interview started off like that because it just lends itself to. It's the hard. Of, it's like, the hard love. questions first. It's the hard <laughs> questions first. Now you're well, you're hold up in uh, you're in Hollywood, aren't you? I am. Yeah. So for most of the time, though, we've been down in Palm Springs. Just that <laughs> <laughs> uh, that 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 there'll be a person sort of secretly not secretly walking through the shot at various times well this is the joy of working from home <laughs> and you hear about all these like disastrous zoom stories of like you know naked people walking in the back or somebody forgets to put their laptop down and uh, ends up in a compromising position with the nanny <laughs> um, <laughs> or little children coming in and swearing yeah well that's all of that rolled into one for me that's your compromising <laughs> position walking past in the background yeah, then. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> that'll be michael i believe <laughs> yes that is my call my other half your other half lovely the lovely michael um so you've been in Palm Springs a lot of the time. Yeah, so we were hunkering down there sort of during the lockdown. And um, yeah, but uh, coming back between both places, um, but, but mainly now spending uh, most of my time here back in L.A. Right. Now, you, how long, you've had an anniversary of being in L.A. recently, haven't you? you was it a big, how long have you been here? Twen yeah. Say again? 21 years. 21 years in L.A. So you're, you're virtually, well, you are American as well now. Uh, yeah, I'm a citizen. I came, became a citizen nine years ago. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm allowed to vote and all that good stuff. Hmm, I wonder <laughs> who you'll be voting for. Hmm. Hmm. Flip of the coin. <laughs> Vice President Kanye West, of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm interested in is, the question is, what brought you to L.A. or what brought you to America? Was it something that you always wanted to, to do, to come to? Um, I will actually blame it on a misspent youth of watching television programs like Airwolf and A-Team and Beverly Hills 90210. Right. And um, ALF. <laughs> ALF. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had I sort of had this love affair with America even before arriving. Uh, and yeah, it was to do with, you know, the imagery that we were spoon fed at tea time in England or on Saturday afternoons and um, just knew from a very early age that one day I was going to live in America. And what what was the moment that pushed it forward? Did you do a recce mission? Because when I first came out here. Well, I had family here, so I'd come when I was like four years old, but and come in, you know in the, in the holidays. But um, properly, I came out for a recce mission and did like that week industry Hollywood thing, and met agents and casting directors, and you know was schmoozed by it all. Did did you do something like that? Yeah. Um, so I was on a show in the UK called Dream Team. And I um, had two weeks holiday. And I, and I pri uh, previously to being on the show, I was working as a bartender in a, in a bar in just off of Soho Square in London. And one of the other bartenders had just moved to L.A. And so we were kind of um, writing letters back and forth as one did back then in those dark, dark ages. 
Um, and uh, he kept saying, come out, come visit, come visit. And so now I finally knew some knew somebody that lived there. I was like, oh, okay, cool. I could go stay with him and really kind of check it out. So I remember arriving on my own on a plane, clearly on a plane, because, I mean, we're not going to be taking the Titanic anytime soon. How old were you? Uh, <laughs> how old am I exactly? No, how old, how old were you then? When oh, you came? I was uh, 23. Okay. 23, yeah. And um, I, I did come for the purpose of being on holiday. Um, but I had a friend in London who knew a couple of people in the business in Hollywood and said, why you are there, you should meet with these people. Um, one of those uh, persons was Louisa Spring, who was with Russ Lister Management at the time, who looked up to Piers Brosnan and... Um, um, Piers Brosnan and um, some other people like Piers Brosnan, <laughs> and uh, um, so uh, I had a I had a lovely lunch with Russ Lister and Louisa Spring, and uh, they were like, "Hey, we want to sign you," and I'm like, "Oh shit, that's <laughs> it happened just as easy as that. That's nuts." Um, I think it did help because I was on uh, you know a show in the UK. Um, and they were like, hey, can we put you out on auditions while you're here for like this two weeks holiday? I'm like, yeah, sure. Um, so they put me up for a movie called Go with Katie Holmes. Um, it was directed by Doug Lyman um, and I, Joseph Middleton was direct, uh, cast, casting it. And so I went in and met with him. Uh, he gave me a call back. It was the first audition I went in on. Uh, but his note was to come back in looking uglier. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, yeah, I was 23 and really hot, so I don't know how I'm going to manage that. <laughs> um, but I did my damnedest. I went to Wasteland, which was this secondhand clothing store on Melrose, and got the ugliest clothing I could find. And I was like trying to make my ears stick out and like, I roughed up my hair and, you know, I did brush my teeth for a day. Uh, and um, I went in and, and Joseph was like, what the hell happened? You look cuter now than you did yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, if I know. Anyway, I, needless to say, I didn't get that job. Um, but, um, yeah, it kind of sowed, sowed, you know, sowed the seeds. And um, I went back to London and finished my contract. Uh, on Dream Team, and that was my main focus. Was once that show, once my contract ended, was to get out to LA as soon as I possibly could. And but how you know it's so difficult to well certainly now, and I don't. Maybe it was a bit easier then. I certainly was maybe pre two thousand and ten. Um, but with visas and being allowed to work and all of that stuff, you know. Uh, we'll get to Brits in LA and one of the questions is, hi, I like America. How can I come and work there? I want to be an actor. <laughs> and we, we all go, <laughs> <laughs> But you kind of did that thing without the uh, anything. Um, yes and no. I think partly uh, Russ, ha uh, Russ Lister, who was my manager, had done visas for Julian Lennon, um, and Piers Brosnan, and they represented a lot of Brits, Stephen Burkhoff, uh, John Reese davies uh -huh. And so they put me in touch with their lawyer. Uh, at the time, uh, he's passed away now, but his name was Ralph Aaron Price. So I went to this big, massive office in Century City. Um, you know, I, I, once again, when I came out again, I came out as a tourist. Um, once my contract was over... And, um, you know, I had a return ticket, went up to see Ralph Aaron Price. Um, this was in 1999. And uh, he's like, well, let me see what you've done. Uh, we could probably get you a couple of deal memos. Mm -hmm. um, go, um, you know, just leave it with me. Pay me a ton of cash. And um, the, we'll American, the American way. The American way. How to get money things talks. done. Money talks, yeah. yeah. And um, so I spent an awful lot of money on a visa. 
And uh, that was how it started. And then after I had my first visa, I started booking a lot of roles in uh, in LA. And um, I was signed a contract with MTV on a show called Spider Games, which was their sort of first foray into scripted television. Um, and because they were doing obviously music videos and all that kind of stuff before. And so they offered me a contract. And then with once I got into that contract, my lawyer recommend that I, I apply for my green card. So that's what got me my green card. And then um, subsequently, seven years after that, I applied for citizen, citizenship. So that was my path to citizenship. So that would have been what, 2006? And the first uh, when I got my citizenship. Oh, no, no, because you, 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 there was a longer yeah. period. So, uh, to that, so I just actually looked at my passport because it's up for renewal next year. Uh-huh. So it would have been, so 2021, so 2011, I became a citizen. Wow, okay. So um, jumping back, you were in a pop band called Deuce. Now, was that? Did that predate Dream Team? Yeah. Yeah. So that was sort of, uh, it was, uh, you know, it's funny because we, th- we think of a, a genre of music being boy band music, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone's like, oh, boy band music, boy band music. I mean, but it's not really the genre. The genre is pop. Mm-hmm. And so I was in a pop band that had two boys in it and two girls in it called Juice, like tennis and not like the drink. Right. <laughs> And then, uh, we were we were dubbed the ABBA of the nineties, but by who? <laughs> <laughs> by some PR maven. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but we had uh, you know we had a little bit of a su- success. We had four singles. You know, we were on top of the pops. We toured with E17 and Take That and Boyzone and, you know, all the kind of like the big bands around the time. But, um, you know, we we just sort of weren't meant to be. It was kind of like one of those. I don't think any of us were really in it for the right reasons. Um, I think uh, that it was a good way to spend, you know, my late 20s into my, uh, sorry, my late teens into my 20s. Um, but it was also a great, you know, foot in the door in many respects as, yeah. in terms of acting. Because, you know, prior to that, we all know how hard it is to, you know, to get opportunities in this town or in any town, and especially London, you know, the theatre scene, the TV scene, you know, there's a, it's, a long, it's a long journey and so many of artists don't make it and... So it, for me, it was definitely a um, an opportunity that I saw, that I ran with and had a lot of fun with, but it was never my end game. So did you look on it as a stepping stone towards acting? Did you want to be an actor at that point? Or yeah. Was that always your thing? Yeah. So um, from the age of 10, so I'd, I'd started acting at the age of 10. I was in a play called The Price of Coal by Barry Hines at the Nottingham Playhouse with my sister. Right. We played brother and sister in it. And that was my first sort of, you know, taste of um, wanting to be uh, an actor. Um, and, the, and that was the bug. That was like, it, from that moment on, that's all I ever wanted to do. And you grew up in Nottingham? I did, yeah. And then wh- what age did you get to London then? Was that the next step, London? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, the, the thing is, is that, you know, when you kind of grow up in a, um, you know, like in a working class family, I guess, you know, where there aren't many opportunities, you, you know, Nottingham had, you know, a, a good sort of local theatre scene, but there was no real um, opportunities for anybody if you wanted to you know, do this full time. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I took a career in teaching aerobics. <laughs> I took, you know, I was, uh, worked on a market. I worked in a shoe shop. Uh, I worked behind bars. You know, I did everything I could in order to 
make money, save money. And, and all I ever did was save, 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 save. My dad was really smart in, you know, uh, teaching me that value young to save money. I don't know what happened to that now, but, um, <laughs> but you know, I did. I literally opened a bank account at the age of 16, like a savings account. And any money I got just kept going in, into that sort of nest egg right. in order to go to London. I mean, like Dick Whittington. Yeah, but it's an interesting theme because you kind of brought up a theme that's actually reflective of you even today, and that is versatility and being able to adapt and be and being creative. And I think that's what informs you as an actor, and I think that makes you a better actor because you're not just a person who's, oh, I'm an actor, I've always been an actor, that's all I do. Even at that point, you're transitioning from being in a, in, a, in a pop band to dream team to being a waiter to coming to America into the unknown, which, let's face it, this is a, there's a theme that I want to really pick up on. But w- arriving in America when you did, so what we said, uh, 99, yeah? Yeah. 99, it's a different world out there. We don't have the mobile phone technology. We don't have the internet where, like we have it. To, well, I'm not even sure. We do. No, yeah. I think the internet just started roughly. Just started, yeah. And America was, I mean, it still is, but LA specifically, I think, is a lonely place. You don't know people. And uh, I think and, and that clearly became a real important uh, tentpole for you in, in what you developed into doing which we'll come on to, but you've always been someone who adapts. Now, I met you in 2010, which is a a fun story anyway as well. But uh, you're constantly adapting. You're constantly looking for something. Whatever needs must, you'll do it. And it's never seemed to be, it's never seemed to be something that's got in the way of your main vision. So all of those things have only added to your experience and created your network, which is which is amazing, you know, and kudos for it because it's I think it's a really important lesson that people starting off in the business need to know. Yeah. Um I mean obviously there are those that have been, you know, more fortunate in terms of, you know, stepping off a plane and it happening right away. But I think the reality for most of us is that we have to hustle. Um, it's not an easy path. Um, and for me, you know, there was a turning point probably uh, probably when I hit 30. So five years into being into Los Angeles of realizing that I got to experience life. Mm. I can't just be, I would, because, you know, I arrived here, I was in class, classes like, you know, three times a week. I was in voice classes. I was in, you know, um, the peak in my fitness, you know, like I was putting this package together that I was kind of, you know, guided through to be this, you know, the best version of myself that I could possibly be this actor. And that came at a price for me not living life or experiencing thing, you know, things that would come to me um, that helped shape me. Like you said, you know, I I think that when I hit 30, I kind of had this aha moment um, of how can I play all of these roles in life that are coming up? if I don't have any experience in that, and that doesn't mean to say, you know, you know, if I'm playing a junkie that I have to experience in drugs or being method, <clears throat> but just in the, in, in the terms of, you know, that life experience of actually out there living and creating relationships and um, whether that's friendships or love or, you know, falling out with somebody and creating an enemy, you know, like, There's all of these things that build us and shape us and are able to inform our artistry, our work. Um, And so in terms of 
you know, I, I see myself as somewhat of a bit of a shapeshifter in terms of the roles that I play. You know, net and heart very rarely are, if you were to look at my body of work, are two roles ever the same. Mm. Of course, I bring myself to every role. Sorry about that. I just don't know how to turn those bloody damn beeps off. Um, I don't know how, um, you know, to... I can't even... What was my training for? What was I saying for? <laughs> I was on some tangent. Sorry, it I, drift, it, I sure. drifted off then. I was playing a game <laughs> under the... Uh, never mind. Uh, no. oh, that, that, I'll come back to that. Uh, I was saying that, you know, no two roles are the same. And I think that's a testament to living your life and going out and experiencing different things that you can bring back to your artistry. Yeah, I think that's really important. And, you know, that... <sighs> we have to keep growing and I don't think necessarily it happens just being in one box and you know I and I you know I've seen you play numerous parts as well and it's not it's never Craig it's yes it you you bring yourself to it but they are very diverse and different characters and you do actually get to play a lot of characters which is yeah. you know ultimately I think it's the best part I mean it's the most exciting yeah. Brilliant. And I, I, and I'm, you know, I used to be jealous of those other actors uh, that, you know, were male leads and, you know, like the Hugh Grants of the world or whatever. But then I got to all those people that were on long running shows. Yeah. And then, you know, around that same time of being here for five years and thinking, you know, wait a minute, you know, actually I have the best job because I get to guest star on all these shows and, be able to become something completely different from myself, yeah. you know, and, and challenging myself all the time. Like, how do I create this character? Do you think, so, do you think, you know, there's been, we, we, we're living through a very uh, interesting age and a lot has come to the front about the way people are treated and the way people treat um, or don't treat other people. And you've been, you've been there in that experience. You've really experienced that. How did you find? How were you treated? Um, certainly in the beginning, as a, a, you know, trying to get jobs, and then when you did get jobs, did you find you were treated well? Did you did you find it, it was a, a, a there was exploitation happening, or did you find it a, a pleasant experience generally? Hmm. I think um, <clears throat> I think there was definitely moments of. Um, people taking advantage or, you know, wanting to um, date me or bed me or, you know, um, in certain situations. But, um, and that was, that was hard to sort of battle because, I mean, without naming names, I remember an incident where I was like, wow, that guy could really change my life. You know, if I, if I went, if I, if I went, you know, with that guy or I, you know, slept with that guy against my better nature or put up with that or live with someone like that, then that could change my life forever. Mm -hmm. And then sort of, <laughs> I don't know, having, having the, that thought of, well, that I wouldn't have ever done it, you know, on my own. It would have always been because of that, you know. You know, we talk about the casting couch and all of that, right? And there's definitely yep. been opportunities for that, and and I have definitely been presented with a lot of that. But it's always, and I, and you know, looking back, obviously, it, it's disgusting and it's horrible. But <clears throat> when you're that young and impressionable you can see how very easy it is for people to be seduced by somebody in power. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, I was strong enough to, you know, um, deter some of those advances. Um, there was, you know, a particular time when I, I feel like something happened and I was not in the right frame of mind and then blacked out and didn't realize and then kind of knew something had happened, um, you know, when I was younger, but then just kind of brushed it off. Um, but it's always sort of stuck with me, you know, there's definitely been that. 
Um, but not in the vein of, you know, um, sleeping with somebody to further my career, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Cause it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think there's, I mean, there is the abuse, obviously, that goes on and the abuse of power, but there's also the choice to, whether it is the choice to be abused, I don't know, but it, or is the choice to get to where you want, irrespective of the personal damage that that may or may not do. Or not, you know, or just, you, the, the, there are definitely people who don't care about that and they have a vision and they want to get there, whatever. Do you think that's true? I don't know, because I don't know everybody's personal journey. Right. Um, and obviously there's rumors and speculation about certain people that have slept their way to the top, you know, versus, <clears throat> you know, those people that have genuinely, genuinely been abused Yeah. Um, by powerful people. And we've seen it in the media and we know who we're talking about. And, mm-hmm. um, and you know, that's awful and that's terrible and that definitely messes with somebody's mind and their mental health yeah you know? and um you know i don't think any abuse is right at all you know uh, whether you, like w- on whatever level you're on you know that it's just not okay i mean there's you know uh, aside from the the, the the sexual scenarios that have arisen there's there's often been the kind of verbal bullying and that's also come to the front again as well. The way people, it, 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 it's amazing because so much of it is so unnecessary. Uh, the power yeah, games. One of my first jobs in, um, in Los Angeles was I was a, a PA working on a Janet Jackson video uh, for All For You. And um, the, the costumer on that video said to me, uh, if Janet walks by, never look in the eye and never, ever um, strike up conversation with her. And I'm like, okay. And then I ended up working for this guy who was in living in New York and I was in LA and he would come out and he'd do photo shoots and video shoots and this and that. And he'd always be styling Janet Jackson. And one time he wanted me to go to her house and drop off these clothes. So I knock on the door and she answers. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> like well, hi, Craig. I'm like, hello, Miss Jackson. And she's like, come in in. And I'm like going into the house like Quasimodo. Like, she's like, um, uh, just put those over there. And I'm like, okay, okay. So I put them over there. And I'm like, okay. She went, do you want anything to drink? And I'm like, no, thank you, Miss Jackson. I'm, it's Janet. And I'm like, no, thank you, Janet. It's fine. <laughs> and I like, literally like going out of the door as fast as I could, sweating profusely because I was scared of losing my job. Do you think she, that was genuine? She would have reacted to you like that? No, no. I don't. I, and my point is that I think it's people around the, the star or the celebrity that make this become a thing. And I do think that the reason why this particular guy, uh, stylist, was that way was because he didn't want anyone to get too close to her because he felt like his job was perhaps in jeopardy in some way. And if she liked someone better... Uh, over him, then he might be on the out, out, you know, out the door, and somebody else new comes in. Um, I mean, I never wanted to be a stylist, but you know, for one, I'm one, I'm colorblind, so how could I be? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so yeah. So uh, anyway, so yeah, th- I, I totally feel that a lot of it is there's the king, and then there's the king makers. Right. right, the people around the king that make that person look like a king. I think then we you about that in acting as well, don't we? Yeah, and but I think you have to value yourself, and you actually have to learn how to be. You know, it's very difficult, I suppose, and it comes with age and experience, as you said, with the you know the different things and being worldly. But you come to a point where you don't really give a fuck. You know, you reach that point where you say, "This is me, and I'm going to act like I act." So take it or leave it. Hello, I'm me. And if someone reacts unreasonably to you, then they're they're being unreasonable. Yeah. I mean, it's just simple as that. It's just a human reaction. I'm not going to go and kowtow to someone for the sake of anything because it. Do you feel it's 
those parts that you audition for, you know, when you don't really care, you're not really bothered, you're not wound up, you go in, you're like, yeah, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to lay myself on the line here. And I'm quite happy. And you go in and you're yourself. And more often than not, you get those parts. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think that <clears throat> a lot of the time when you're going in for a role, you know, the reason why some of the casting directors, the good casting directors, are looking to see who you are as a person as well and what you'll be like on set and whether you're going to, you know, fit well with everybody else that's working on this show. So they don't want you to be nervous. You know, they don't want you to be an asshole. They don't want you to be totally in character and like, you know, they want to get to know who the person is as well. Um, and I think that's somewhat important. Um, yeah, of kind of, you know, laying down your arms and bearing your heart and soul and just being you, as you said. Hello, it's me. <laughs> Maybe that's what, what your podcast should be called. <laughs> <laughs> Reinventing my podcast, yeah. Uh, but it, I think it's really important. I think it's, you, you know, the valuing of yourself is everything. And that's not being a diva. That's not being unreasonable. That's being reasonable and putting the work in. But like you say, you know, so many directors you hear talk about that they cast their film over coffee or over a drink. They're not casting it because they watch the tapes. They're casting mm. it because they get a, a feel of you and think, you know what, this guy, the, the next six months of my life, we're going to work together. Yeah. <laughs> I want to have a nice time. Yeah, it's true. Most definitely. What's the, but, you know, gone. obviously having done the work and, and, you know, having the craft and also knowing that you have a resume that warrants them hiring you as well. Mm -hmm. And you have to build to that position as well. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword because sometimes you have to do things you don't want to do because you have to build, meet people, experience, get those, yeah. get those stories under your belt. Oh, my God. I think I did about 20 student films when I first arrived here. <laughs> and talk about films that I did not want to do. Yeah. But I, we used to have, um, and of course it was the day before Digital Age, we had the Backstage West, um, and I literally would sit down and I would circle all of the roles that I was right for. I would cut them out, and I would stick them on a piece of paper, and that, like a fi I had a, a file, and like every day, and I would write, uh, submit myself to everything that was available, because all I had on my showreel was Dream Team. And it was all about building up that reel. And so there was a, a lot of real crap that I did when I first came out here. But I needed to in order to show, you know, uh, casting directors, because it was all about sending your tape out then as well. You know, they were like, hey, can you send the demo tape before even getting an audition? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how, how long ago it was that I came here. But, you know, it was you had to have a good tape in order to get scene yeah it's uh it, it's interesting that journey the change of technology and the change of well the change of technology that's kind of pushed it forward and yet things still are difficult and they're just difficult in a different way um and it's kind of like people talk about all these apps or all the software that you can get. And it's like, it's so easy to make a film now. We can do it on our iPhones. Why are we not all making films on our iPhones? But it actually comes back to the very crux of it is, have you written a good story? Is this worth filming? Who cares if you've got all the technology in the world? You still have to write it. It still has to be something worth filming in the first place and developing. Yeah. So, yes, there's, there's a, you know, a million films now because... Everything's a film because it's on TikTok. It's a 10-second film or, you know, it's my movie. It's on TikTok. It's like, but, but it still comes down to the quality of the writing and the quality of the artistry. And I, I think people are getting actually sidetracked. And maybe there's less quality now because there's too much rubbish. And people are not being... Um, pushed into actually learning their craft, which is something that you you were talking about. Carrying on training, it never ends. And and that UK type of mentality 
Whereas, you know, I went to drama school three years at drama school. You kind of come out of drama school there and you go, ah, I did drama school. I am now a fully fledged actor. I don't need to train anymore. And then you come to America and they're like, well, what, what classes are you doing? You're like, classes? I don't need to do classes. I'm like, well, you maybe should do some classes. <laughs> well, you know, I, I equate it to being a doctor or a surgeon, right? If you're a surgeon, you're still going to learn about new technologies that come in and, you know, new studies and this and that. You, you're not, you know, once you graduate and you get your PhD, that's not the end. You, you may be now classified a doctor mm-hmm. or a surgeon, but you still have to continue your training. Yeah. And I think it's the same as an actor. I don't think it ends, you know. I think that we have a, uh, there's a world of knowledge out there and a world of experience and, and types. And as we age, you know, our casting becomes different. And, you know, so then it's all about characters and how do I embody this character? How do I create this? Like, what is, what is the research I need to do in order to play this character? Um, you know, there's so much, like we're constantly learning and and constantly honing our craft and you have to enjoy that. Mm -hmm. Like I think as a, as a true, a true artist, you have to enjoy that journey and knowing that training is a part of that continued journey. Did you find that your sexuality was a hindrance uh, when you first came out here? Because I think now it's become, you know, just it seems to be more open. You can be whoever you are. But there was definitely a period where it had to be hidden or it felt like it had to be hidden. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, it, it and that's probably why, you know, for me, not being my true authentic self probably hurt me a lot um, in terms of my acting journey because I was hiding so much that, you know, I just wanted to go in the rooms and do the job and like, you know, not give anything away, like playing this big tough guy or whatever, or, you know, villains. And um, like if, if, if I, if I speak, if I stay too long, they may get onto me and, and think that I'm gay and therefore being gay is bad. And therefore I'm not going to get the role. And, you know, like just these mind fucks that you play with yourself, wrong term of term, but <laughs> you know, that the, they play upon you yeah. and, you, um, yeah, you end up sabotaging yourself a great deal, I think. And it took me a while, you know, and that was the advice then. And, and I think you're right in terms of times changing. I was advised, you know, I didn't tell my managers or agents for a long time. Um, you know, and I remember one time my manager saying, oh, uh, so-and-so said that you're gay. Is it true? And I'm like, don't they say that about Keanu Reeves? Don't they say that about, you know, you know, all these, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, I mean, God, like, why don't people just give, give it a rest? You know what I mean? Like, and, and, and she was like, oh, I'm only, you know, I'm only saying that because if anybody you know, were to find out, it might have a, a real impact on your career. Um, so the advice was always to stay in the closet. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I, I think... You know, now I think for the younger kids coming out today that there's less of that. It's less of like a big announcement of, I am coming out. It's just much more of like a a slow, oh, and I happen to be gay. Right. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's great. And we're moving in the right direction. I do still believe that there's homophobia in Hollywood. Right. Um, I think it exists. I think that um, like, just like we have racism, I think that we know is a, is, that exists. I think homophobia exists too. I think that they look at numbers and they think, Oh, I can never cast this guy as a male lead um, opposite Emma Stone. If he's gay, because the public aren't going to believe it. Mm -hmm. And if the public don't believe it, then therefore I'm, I'm not going to sell tickets. Uh, But as you know, proven with a lot of fine uh, LGBTQ plus actors now, that's not the case. You know, like Luke Evans is out there playing the beast in Beauty and the Beast, you know, and playing, you know, a very strong male lead. Um, Matt Bomer was on White Collar playing, you know, a cad and very convincingly and nobody batted an eyelid. Mm -hmm. So you have to have these kind of groundbreaking people and moments 
at the same time for people to go, oh, actually, yeah, I believe that. That guy's a really fucking good actor, you know, and not be taken out of the moment because they're thinking, ew, he's kissing a girl. Right. That's not that's not real. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, guess what? Superman's not real. He can't fly in the fucking sky. <laughs> <laughs> so where does that come in with the idea? You know, I was talking about this before with Lenara Washington, who's an actress who we were talking about how the Oscars are doing this kind of you have to fit different role, uh, different, how to put it? Uh, it's the criteria. Yeah, to, they, you know, yeah. you need an LGBTQ plus. So there's a lot of letters there. Um, Don't person, be jealous. Don't yeah. be jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Little bit jealous. Um, <laughs> but you've got to, you, it becomes, do you think it becomes a bit of box ticking and it takes away from the fact that, you know, I, I I think we talked about it once. But there was a film with an Iowa farmer or something, and they wanted to cast, they wanted more balanced casting. But it was it was set in a farm in Iowa, and so it wouldn't have been an Asian character, for example. But if right. you have to, if you have to, you are forced suddenly to tick the box to put someone in that fits that box. You're you're right. compromising. You're a the story or the thing that you have to do. Right. So I think that, you know, there, so it's reparations, right? It's reparations. So I think for me, so for so long, um, black uh, people of color, women, uh, the people in the LGBTQ community have been marginalized, right? And they have not been given the opportunities that, you know, white straight males have. However, I think that there is a line. I think that, you know, we should see beyond color and gender and um, sexual identity because the only way we're going to see past that is if we saw see more of it on screen. And I think that we have a moral, um, it's a moral dilemma of, you know, just making entertainment for entertainment's sake? Or do we have this amazing platform to change people's minds about people, you know? Um, I think, you know, you know, the right person for the right job, yeah. But, you know, it, I believe it will balance out eventually, but we're at a wrecking point, And I think that it has to be wrecked in order to shape anew. Um and it's unfortunate for some, obviously, but however, I think that those that have not been given opportunities are way too long, that it's, it's about time. And, um, and, you know, it's about those voices because, you know, I was having a conversation with someone, I'm, I may have something in development, and, you know, and the three of us are white guys sat around talking about you know, how do we make this diverse? You know, we're having that conversation because no one's going to buy this because the story is not diverse. Mm -hmm. And then we start opening up a conversation about, well, you know, we need to have a writer's room that is diverse as, you know, to make this story as diverse as it possibly can be. So it's, you know, um, because he does have, he has a, um, you know, a, a couple of biracial characters in there and, having and he's like you know it's i don't feel like it's my job to to i need i need i want those voices to be authentic so i need writers in the room that are you know are, are authentic and can write well for these characters and i think that's the problem is we've had too many white males writing for women you know writing for um you know look at brokeback mountain you know um that was a a, a straight man story and um, and it was directed by a straight man and you know what I mean? Like, so you can kind of go into who knows what, but I think that with, without giving, you've got to give opportunity to the people, as you said earlier, it starts with the story. You've got to give those people with the voices, the opportunity to be heard. Right. And then, you know, that's where we kind of move forward. I think as a society, mm -hmm. um, you know, now if we're doing something, Historical, I don't think there's anything wrong with putting people of color in Shakespeare. I think that in the streets of London back in the day that people of color were doing Shakespeare. 
and gay people, but we're probably, you know, and they were probably far more accepted back in those times as well. You know, men wearing uh, women's dresses, you know, it was all part of um, the theater of it all. Um, but somewhere along the way, the church got involved and, mm-hmm. you know, everybody got pushed back even further. Um, and politicians as well, you know, and I think power has, has kind of definitely played a huge part in why, what we're seeing on the screen in the last 30, 40 years. It's an, it's, uh, it's a, it, it, the question as well with the, with the, if you have to employ a gay person, then whose business is it though? Do you know what I mean? It's like, excuse me. Oh, hello, Craig. Are you gay? Great. <laughs> We've got one. You know, it's, <laughs> it becomes, it, it, it will become that a little bit, don't you think? Whereas it's like, if I'm hiring Craig, I'm just hiring Craig. And uh, that. But, if, but before this, Paul, if you knew that Craig was gay, you have an opportunity to say, I'm not hiring. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Whereas sure. now, now you now you are your hands are tied because we've moved so far in society where it says it's not okay to do that to Craig. Um, so if Craig is the right person for this and he happens to be gay, then he checks a box for you. Right. But you know, if you, you may not Craig want- is right, but Craig is gay, then Craig becomes not right. Then. That's not going to check a box for you, right? But you, you may not want to. That. You may not want to share that. That may not be. That, you know, it's 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 clearer with a with a mixed race person or a black person, or you can tell immediately. You go okay, but if it's someone who's gay or, or straight or trans or whatever, you're not necessarily going to know, and they don't necessarily want to tell you anyway. I mean, it's 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 like. It's kind of not your business. That's a question for you. Why don't they want to tell you, Paul? Because it's just maybe someone feels it's not their their business. They're just there to play the part. And they don't want to they don't want to discuss their private life, their sexuality. Um, I know a trans person who doesn't want to discuss her pre trans existence. Doesn't want to discuss it. So yeah. it's it as far as she's concerned, it's a it. I you know I may be putting words into her mouth. I don't know, but from what I've gathered, it's not something she wants to put into the equation. So if she were an actor, she would be, you know, I am a woman for this part. And if we didn't know, if we didn't know, she would just be the woman, you know, a woman playing a woman's role. If we didn't yeah. know. Right. Um, I, I understand what you're saying. Mm-hmm. I think, I think the, 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 what I'm, I hope that I'm not hearing is that it's, um, you know, that somebody doesn't want somebody to know because they're afraid. Right. So if they're afraid of somebody finding out, then I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping that we're moving to a society that's a little bit more, accepting of that and allowing people to be their authentic selves. Nobody's going to ask in a room. They're not allowed to ask in a room, you know, what your age is or what your, how you identify. Right. Um, You know, so they're not allowed to ask that. So Uh they just have to assume it or not assume it. So in terms of ticking that box off, they can only, you know, if, if somebody is, is out, 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 <laughs> um, then, you know, then they get to tick that box. But right. Rightfully so. If somebody feels like that's a private matter, yeah. who you speak with is a private matter, yeah. then they don't get to check that box. That person is still the right person for that job mm-hmm. because they don't know. They don't get to check that box. It just means they have an extra person on their cast or crew that is. Right. Do you know what I mean? Do you think people will then just say they are in order to tick the box? From well, a, like, from a, Larry, get married. I, I don't know. Did you see that really <laughs> great, awful movie? Well, it was like they needed health insurance uh, in Canada or something. Yeah. And so the only way they could do it is by, you know, there were single guys. And like if they got married, they could get um Oh, okay. Insurance. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, I mean, there's nothing from stopping to you saying that you're bisexual. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. nothing from stopping you. You know, I feel, you know, it's kind of sad if people want to take that route and they want to, you know, um, you know, or that, that they're from somebody that actually is. It's like, you know, so there's people that create an illness, you know, like I'm not saying comparing them, but if you say that you have an illness mm-hmm. to get a benefit sure. and you don't really have that in, in it, that benefit, I think there's karma surrounding that. So uh-huh. I, I would hope that not a lot of people do that, but you know, um, if they do and they, they uh, end up getting a role and it comes out in the paper, it might be a good movie, Paul, you know, someone does that to get a role and they come out in the papers and it's like, Oh, you know, I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus. All of a sudden, you know, they've got a wife and two kids at home that they're hiding in their closet. How happy are they going to be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's move the conversation on. Uh, I wanted to discuss a big, a major thing, actually. Uh, I think it's a major thing in your life as well, which was Brits in LA. Yeah. And this is a really fantastic, for people who don't know, Tell me, what is Brits in LA? I mean, it's been a fantastic tool for so many people for so many years. Well, it, it is what it says on the tin. Right. <laughs> you know, it's basically <laughs> Brits living in Los Angeles. Wow, well, and... how did you write the copy for that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so actually, it was a meeting of minds, and uh, I had been here for a good number of years, maybe six years. And I had the good fortune of meeting Eileen Lee, who's my partner in Brits and Lee, through a mutual friend in London that was visiting me. Um, and I think like a lot of people, you know, I think one of the reasons I moved to LA was because I, it was a place where I could reinvent myself. Um, I was, you know, sort of, It allowed me to be freer and, you know, all of a sudden I was in this place where everybody loved me because I had a British accent. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And I was like, oh my God. And people are like, please say what, 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 what are again? You can't even speak English anymore, can you? You've been here so long. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I definitely have a weird transatlantic accent. Yeah. Um, But uh, yeah, and so, you know, and, and I didn't really... Whenever I saw another Brit, it was sort of like this uncomfortable, like, oh, you might, oh my God, this is my friend Tim. You, you, you guys, you should meet. You, you get on great, and it's like, <laughs> all, right, all right, great. Where are you from? I'm from Nottingham. Oh, oh where are you from? Um, Cambridgeshire. Oh, nice, nice tosser. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you know, and it's sort of like this well nice to meet you bye uh come love me more come love me more over here my american friends <laughs> um so you know i didn't really want to meet a lot of other brits while i was out here and that's just being honest and um <laughs> and then you know lo and behold um uh we started doing these like uh eileen knew more brits than i did and uh uh along with um a couple of her friends started doing like a breakfast club, like just, you know, randomly every Tuesday. And it was like, you know, maybe uh, eight to 10 people would gather. Um, and then uh, I met Darren Darnbra, um, who's, you know, doesn't live in LA anymore, but was sort of a fixture in the early 2000s, in uh, sort of mid 2000s in, in LA. And uh, he came on board and the three of us sort of, you know, started you know more and more people were asking oh where do you guys meet up where can we find you guys and facebook had just started at that time and so we thought well let's put it you know so we can send the information out to just one place let's put it up on facebook create a group so everyone can invite their people so we don't have to keep you know sending the information out all the time and then more and more people wanted to join and it sort of became this uh resource for brits back home moving to los angeles on you know um of a community that had come together that was really helping one another and helping each other out you know hey you know where's where where do i buy my british goods where's the best sunday roast where do i get a curry to you know how do i get a visa to how do i so how do i navigate through this minefield that's called health insurance <laughs> 
um, you know, uh, taxes. What, what do you mean? I, you know, there's no pay EYE. Um, so it became a place where people could share their knowledge and sort of, you know, Brits and LA sort of opened the door and the community kept the door open for others to come in and, you know, get the answers to the, the burning questions. And how many people are subscribed to Brits and LA now? I think we have like 17,000 members. 17,000 members. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we get some idiots on there, but we have to weed, weed them out. You know, I think in this current political climate and the age of the keyboard warriors, mm-hmm. there's a lot of lonely people sat at home that are bored and like to comment yeah. and sometimes not comment in a very nice way. But, you know, Facebook have this really great feature now where people can report people for, you know, um, just being nasty and you know we'll give people a warning but if it if it's a, if it recurs then we just kick them out of the group it's you know we don't want it to be that place yeah we, we welcome healthy debate but when it gets into you know name calling and mudslinging it's just it's not a good representation of the brits that i know here that are genuinely here mm-hmm. that you know tend to want to help each other out and uh, have good hearts and good 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 spirits um so you know yeah i mean i just wanted to point that out because that's something that's been happening of late Mm -hmm. and you know i just don't like it yeah i think there's a you know there's a unfortunate anger in the air and there's also like you said people write things in the moment they don't think or they're at home bored or they do things that they wouldn't do to somebody's face. They wouldn't say to your face. And it's easy to lack nuance online. It's also yeah. easy to, to, to be misunderstood and to misunderstand. And so people need to check, you know, take a breath before they write things. And just because someone says something that they disagree with, maybe you don't need to respond. It's fine. Yeah. Disagree. You don't need to respond online. Yeah. You know, we I can, think it's better for your mental health. Oh, for sure. Well, you know, we can. Yeah. I, I found Twitter. Um, I, di- I I found that point where Twitter was just angry, and then I've got past that point where Twitter's angry, and all the anger stuff. I just kind of let it. Eh, it just fizzles away, and I look for the stuff that I'm actually interested in, and then I find it quite pleasant. It's not such a horrible place. Um, yeah. And and there's been many times yeah. I've wanted to respond in a aggressive, nasty way, <laughs> and I've I might have written it out, and then I put it in my yeah. notes. <laughs> <laughs> I put my notes for later and then I come back to it and go, no, I don't, I'm not going to say that. And it's, it's fine. Now we met because of Brits in LA. We did. Yeah. 2010. Pre- it was Uber. raining. <laughs> it was raining. <laughs> it was love at first sight. <laughs> so you put up an, an ad back then. You just been to Sundance, I think the Sundance film festival. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. And you like, uh, can someone pick me up from the airport? Well, we have to preface this by saying we didn't have Uber or Lyft back then. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it was like, it was a, you know, we w- we'd started sort of a through Brits in LA because tax- taxis were very expensive or there were very few of them. Mm-hmm. And so you could be waiting up to an hour to get a taxi from the airport. So at Brits and LA, we created these sort of like Brits and LA rides. So, you know, we would have people say, hey, you know, pay 40 bucks for a ride, you know, to be picked up at the airport and taken wherever you are. And it was working really well. And, you know, it was like kind of like one of those situations like, hey, is anyone free to pick me up from the airport? Continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, you know, I don't know what your memory of it was, but I, you know, I just, I saw that your name came up and you were organized in uh, Brits and LA. And I thought, perfect perfect person to meet let's let's go you know be open to the universe which we've talked about before and um and you know it there's very in life it's very important to engage with life in a positive way and i you know i remember thinking that those thoughts exactly i thought well this is a positive thing to do i don't know i don't know craig but he runs Brits and LA. That would be interesting. I'm sure it'll be an interesting journey. And so it was. And so it was. And it, what was normally a 40, 30 minute drive 
<laughs> was a two-hour drive in the pissing rain in Los Angeles, which is, I think at that point, hadn't happened for years. No. <laughs> it's like, and we all know what it's like in Los Angeles when it rains. Like, everything just stops. People don't know how to drive. The roads are slick and oily because, you know, all of that build up for, for months of no no water. So, yeah, so everybody's like at a granny pace, just like kind of juddering along the freeway. So we end up having this amazing conversation and I, I dropped you back. And I, I, was I, I think I was a member of the Magic Castle at that point. And I can't remember. We subsequently arranged a Magic Castle evening, I think. But uh, I was looking for a place to stay, and I'd I'd arranged a place to stay, and it sort of fell through with the person that I was going to be staying with. But the the guy actually who I ended up staying with became a really good friend, and I ended up staying there. But I remember very clearly that like the the next night I called you up and I went, uh, the, the, uh, I don't know where I'm going to be staying, and, uh, uh, and you went, we're having pizza. Come on over. Uh, I'm in Fringe. It's the, uh, the they're showing it on TV. Come on, come on over and have pizza. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. And I came on over and had pizza. We watched your episode of Fringe, which I still remember because you played this really creepy. Um, was he German or Eastern European? Yeah, German. German yeah. character who was like this kind of oh, scary kind of <laughs> guy, and uh, and everything was fine. And then we you know, we became good friends and. Uh, but it was, you know, that was Brits in LA, and that, for me, kind of summed it up. You know, just the the. It's like you said, you know, you kind of don't want to meet the Brits here, as well. Because you think they're probably going to be like most of them back home, and I mean this with love in my heart. Yeah. But imagine saying that to someone back home. And they're going, oh, never mind. Have a cup of tea and, you know, it'll, it'll all be all right. Or stay, stay in the bus stop and, like, you know, get, get the first bus in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a certain mentality, Paul, of us, of bricks that move to Los Angeles. And, I, and, uh, and, I, and it's so fantastic to see. And I think that, you know, I experienced it moving here, too, of, of people are willing to open up their homes to you. They're willing to help you on your journey. You know, the um, there's less of that, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, in a facial expression, it's just sort of like, you know, I unbotheredness of, you know, like, oh, God, you know, there's less complaining that, you know, and I, a lot of it, I'm sure, has to do with the weather. Mm. But I do think that there's a general optimism that exists around many Brits that move to Los Angeles. Um and maybe that's why they leave London, because, you know, there's a, there's definitely a negativity uh, that surrounds London um, or all the people of London that doom and gloom. And, you know, there's a constant black cloud following them. And um, and sometimes they just can't see the woods from the trees. And I, I think that here that it's almost like the clouds part and you can go on a hike and get clarity. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the world's not that bad. We, we, I remember, when you say going on a hike and having clarity, I remember exactly one of those hikes with you when you hit a wall and you were saying, you know, these things are difficult, these things are difficult, but I'm, I'm kind of manifesting these ideas. I'm going to kind of focus on these positive thoughts and these positive ideas. And suddenly it was amazing. It was, there was a moment of clarity where all those difficulties suddenly flipped and you suddenly like all these doors started opening and these other things starting opening and it kind of comes full circle to, to um, being able to be diverse in the things that you do and, and hustle. And that kind of brings me on to, um, to Jeff Goldblum because it's fascinating. How did that start? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it started around that, but the, you know, that was a pivotal moment that I remember that conversation. I remember that hike very clearly. Yeah. yeah me too. Me too. Yeah. Um, I was, you know, and I, and I think it's important to recognize uh, when you are in a funk and when you are in, um, you know, some 
down moment and or, or you know things aren't going your way and I think it's really important to recognize that and kind of think about how to get out of it and I remember it was um like you know money was my savings were dwindling you know I wasn't getting any acting work um you know just life was feeling I was just feeling really shitty about life in general and I couldn't get out of this funk and I think a lot of people find themselves in this and it's like you know god I wish you know something will happen just like you know please give me a sign give me something and um I had you know I'd, I'd done I've done so many different jobs out here like from waiting tables to you know catering to um you know making my own movies just like so many different things and and I think that um I got this I got this through Brits in LA funnily enough somebody was looking for a driver to drive a contributor from Palm Springs to Los Angeles for 200 bucks and obviously I saw it saw it and I was like I'm going to take, you know, I'm going to answer that because I happened to be in Palm Springs at that time. And I was like, well, you know, I'll, I'll take him down to Palm Springs and I'll bring him back again, you know, and that's 200 bucks. That's great. Uh, so I got talking to this guy who was really fascinating. He was a, a photographer in the war, Vietnam War. Um, you know, obviously it's a two hour drive. We're chatting along the way and he's fascinating and we're talking about life and everything. And he, he was there to talk about this book that he'd written, which was the soundtrack to the Vietnam War. And he was a, sort of all the songs that they listened to to get them through that, that hard, the hard times of war. Um, and so I'd done this job and I take him back and he invites me in to meet his family. We have, you know, a glass of wine back in Palm Springs. And, you know, just he was just such, so fascinating. And I get a, a an email the next day from the producer to say, oh my God, thank you so much. The contributor said how amazing you were and, you know, you made him feel really comfortable and he was really, um, Hi. <laughs> he was really, uh, you know, happy with me. And I was like, okay, great. And then, you know, I didn't hear anything for like four months. And then out of, out of the blue, I get an email from that production company based in London to say, hey, we have a director coming out from London who's doing a scout for a show and he needs somebody to drive him around. Um, are you free and available? You know, we remembered you from the last job. And I was, and that was when I was at my lowest point and we, you know, going on our hike. And uh, I was like, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm free. That's great. An opportunity's come in. I'm going to take it. So I drove this director around. Um, Nick Stacy, brilliant guy from London, um, you know, tells me what the show is and says what are you doing for the next six months i want you on this show and the show was the world according to jeff goldblum uh and i was like oh i'd love to but i'm an actor and you know it's pilot season i don't know if i can and uh he was like you know you know well what can we do to sweeten the deal i was like well look you know i'm a little too old to be a pa or a driver you know like i've, I've this is my experience i just was kind of doing this to make a little bit of extra money and so I sent my resume off to the production company in London and they're like, oh my God, like, you know, we, we would really like you to be a part of this show. Um, would you consider a coordinator position? So I was like, yeah, that'd be great. So I ended up working on The World According to Jeff Goldblum, long story short, for um, seven months of last year um, as a coordinator. And it was one of the best experiences of my life. It's just been so, you know, wonderful to kind of reconnect with British people, obviously, but also to be in this wonderful world that is Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> um, and um, to meet the the man, the myth, the legend himself, and to, you know, really understand who he is. And we talked about acting and, you know, we talked about, um, you know, because obviously we had a long drives everywhere because this show is a travel show, essentially. So we spent an awful lot of time together and I can honestly say, you know, not just because he's my boss, but, you know, he's one of the kindest, most gentle, um, caring, thoughtful and intelligent guys I've ever met. Mm. Um, and uh, I think 
I think that's why, you know, he's done so well and has managed to have this breadth of a career um, that, you know, he's able to kind of shape for himself. Because I remember the first day, he's like, you must be Craig. And I'm like, yes. And he's like, mm, mm, my, I'm Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> and I'm like, nice to meet you. And uh, he's like, you too. I've read all about you. And, you know, you're, you're you know, the, 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 I'm so glad that you're here with us. So what he does is, and I, throughout, through the whole season, I realized that he would do this with everybody. So the man does his homework. Like he remembers everybody's names. He studies the call sheet. Mm-hmm. So he has, so when he comes into a conversation, he's present and he, it's not about him. Mm -hmm. He, it's all about the person that he's talking to. And it was a wonderful skill to observe, um, Trevor, that, um, (laughs) um, you know, that, that he could actually be this, a man with humility, but also charm and charisma and, you know, everything that he is as a superstar, but also these simple things of no studying the call sheet and knowing what the PA's name is, Mm -hmm. you know, and that to me spoke volumes about his character. And sort of perhaps, I think that's how you behave as well. I mean, you many a time have called me up and said, there was a great part, you missed it. No, you would say... (laughs) You would have been perfect for that. It was last week. Never mind. Anyway, <laughs> call me back in six. No, you. You know, you've you've done the same. You. You know, you've thought. In fact, with the Jeff Goldblum thing, pre-COVID, right up to COVID, we were at the Magic Castle discussing yeah. doing some magic for Jeff Goldblum. Yeah. Right yeah. up to that moment. I mean, it was yeah. crazy. Um, and you know, again, you. You uh, you get what you put out. I think. I think he's an example of that kind of mentality. Yeah, but I think that it has to come from an authentic place. Yeah. There's a difference. You can tell when someone is working it, and it just re- You know what I mean? There's just the, it reeks of you know this whole notion of networking, and you know it just. I know it's a part of our business. I th- I know that we have to, you know, shoes and network and this and that. But I do think that you are still allowed to have a voice and opinion and be real and, and you know, be honest to yourself. And, and, you know, and I think that you're right. It only comes with age and wisdom that we get there, that we understand that. And I think that's, you know, going back to the Jeff thing that, you know, because he's a a distinguished man of a certain age now that, you know, all of that's probably coming in. I don't know what he was like in the 1980s, but I'm sure it wasn't this version of Jeff Goldblum. Mm -hmm. We get to, we get to be different versions of ourselves throughout our lives. We, you know, we, we, and that's why we can't look back and blame those people or those versions of ourselves, because hopefully we're not those. I mean, how terrible would it be to be you at 20? It's, just wrong it it would be wrong you would have never got anywhere you would have never developed you would have never learned you would have never changed your opinion you would never listen to anybody or had the opportunity to put or change your opinion yeah and it's so it's so important and and that networking thing you know we do it here but if you do it on your terms if you do it as your authentic self as you then it's fine because you go, I'm here to network and meet people. I hopefully, I'd like to be in this film. I'd like to be working. I'd like to, I want to meet you because you're a producer. I'm really interested in that. But you're not bullshitting. You're not playing a game. You're not, you're being totally authentic. And if you don't like that person, it's not going to work. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Yeah. And, And I think that that's why I think the being authentic is the most important thing because as I said, you can see through those people that are, you know, so, and it's, it's done in such a vapid way. Oh, oh my God, you look amazing. You know, and they haven't even seen your outfit yet. You know what I mean? Or, oh my God, do blondes have more fun? And I'm a brunette. Um, <laughs> you know, so, 
yeah, it, it, I think that there's a, a desperation that reeks mm-hmm. through the what we know as networking. Right. You know, we've seen it like at these, you know, open calls or these showcases or the, you know, um, the sort of, uh, you know, speed dating pitch network, I, you know, things. You know, those people are getting paid to be there. They're not, you know, they're not there to buy your idea. They're there because they're getting paid to be there. Mm-hmm. Um, so just be wary of, you know, do your research, be wary of a lot of those kind of networking events. They're there to make the person that puts the event on money. Right. Um, but yeah, so Magic Castle. So yeah, so, you know, we were doing an episode on magic. Uh, coming up for Jeff Goldblum, the world for the second season, and we got shut down because of COVID. Um, but yeah, I did. I, I wanted you to be the guy that led Jeff, uh, tour, you know, a tour through the Magic Castle and perform tricks for him. Um, but obviously, COVID's kind of put a kibosh on all of that. But you're going uh, into a second season. It's going to happen. We, but this was the second season. But, yeah, yeah. So we are we're going back to continue. Right. Um, but on a much scaled down version mm-hmm. uh, of the show, uh, I can't say too much about it, but um, it will still have the same dynamic as the first season, but with less people <laughs> Just and touching, less and breathing places, <laughs> and yes, and six feet apart, and where it, we, you know, the whole thing that we want to try to do, and maybe this is magic is, you know, create this world that sort of takes people away from thinking about this dark time that we find ourselves in right now. And who knows when the show comes out, whether there's a vaccine and we move past this and we can kind of get back to a sense of normality, um, normality or normalcy. Which one do you say, Paul? Whatever you think's right, Craig, is the right <laughs> one. Normality. (laughs) (laughs) No, that's wrong. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) You're fired. (laughs) Let me get my wand back out. (laughs) But you put that away. But you, um, again, you, you, you spun on a dime, as they say. You thought about what opportunities lay ahead, and you created another company. I did. Um, I did indeed. And it's sort of like, you know, well, when when the first season ended, I ended up working on uh, Mank, the David Fincher film. Right, which I was going to come on to, Charlie Chaplin. Um, And then, so I was, you know, and I thought, great, you know, I'm, I'm in this amazing movie working with this amazing director. Now, you know, my agents have something to for me to talk about and it's going to be amazing and like I'm going to go into pilot season with my balls swinging and <laughs> you know it's going to be fantastic I'm going to have job offers galore and my balls swung into a wall called covid and of course everything dried up and seized up and uh the business that is <laughs> not your balls uh, <laughs> not my balls <laughs> they're still low and sweaty right now uh, <laughs> and um, that's an image that you can't get out of your head now, Absolutely, Paul. I know. <laughs> I'll put the air conditioning on in a minute. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, I was thinking of ways. So, so I'd be, I, they offered me the role of a producer for the second season of Jeff Goldblum. So I, I, I graduated from um, a driver to a coordinator to a, a producer. And uh, we, uh we got shut down because of COVID and I was thinking, well, how do we get back? You know, this is a travel show. It's about meeting people. It's, you know, it's such a, it's Jeff's personality is like, you know, he's, he's intimate with people, you know, and intimate in the sense of he gets close, Paul, take your mind out the gutter. Um, and, um, and so I kept thinking about it and it was whirling around my, my brain and we got, we got shut down. We got in lockdown. I don't remember those two weeks in LA at the beginning of this, when we got shut down, we couldn't go anywhere. Um, and we were in Palm Springs and a good friend of mine was 
taking these courses on COVID and she was on LinkedIn and I saw her, she kept posting her certifications, certifications. And I was like, oh, her name's Liz Sterling, by the way. And she's a great fixer. She's like a producer for out of town companies coming in and she produces, you know, uh, uh, in America, uh, the, the productions for people. And so I had, I, I talked to her about it. I was like, what, what, what is this that you're doing? Thinking about the show. And, um, you know, there was no sort of beginning or end in sight for us to get back with Jeff. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to do one of these courses just to find out, you know, to satisfy my curiosity about us getting back to work. And I did this course called iSafe, which was out of Ireland. And it was the, it was the only course that was out there. Um, and it was COVID, uh, COVID-19 compliance officer course. So I got on there and I did two, this two hour course and I'm like asking all these questions and I'm, you know, learning, learning, learning. And I was like, wait a minute. If, if this is a real thing, then everyone's going to need this. Everyone's going to need this role getting back to work. And since I'm not working right now, maybe this is an avenue that I can explore. Mm -hmm. So then I started to read up on it and there was the guideline sent out by the unions and there was a guideline sent out by the um, academy. Um, and then there was uh, all of the, you know, about how to do this, how to operate, how to get back to work. And this was before June and we were scheduled to get back to work on June 11. <laughs> and, um, and then there was this other one course that finally came out in, in Los Angeles that I took health and safety, uh, health education services course. And so I did this and I did that. And then um, I was like, I'm just going to put this certification out online on, on Facebook and just to see what comes in. And then I started getting, all, my phone was ringing off the hook. Hey, you certified. Can you come and do this job for us? We've got this job coming up. I need somebody. Da, da, da. Do you know anyone else? It, it was like this flurry of activity of people wanting COVID compliance for their sets. And um, I got on this, uh, uh, I got on a, 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 digi a, a digital uh, series first uh, for QT and it was just a one person operation. So I thought it was a great place for me to try out my, my sort of plan, you know, to kind of, you know, I'd done all of the homework. I just now needed a sort of a, a uh, a platform to try it out and this was like because i didn't want to go on like a you know a hundred crew movie and just be like oh what the fuck do i do i wanted somewhere really small so it was a cast of two and it was a crew of six right i was like great so you know i got to do my signage put up my signage I hand out my ppe do the questionnaires um go around you know reminding people to keep six feet apart um I'm really, cut, you know, uh, wiped down the box lunches that came in. Like, you know, I was cleaning toilets, you know, like it was, I was literally, you know, cleaning toilets. Um, and just thought, you know, I got to know what everybody does on in this before I can start putting a team together. And so that was my first job. And then my second job was a, uh, a commercial in Detroit where everyone was petrified to get back to work. Mm -hmm. The producers, the directors. Everyone was really scared because we'd been out of work for two months and we know about this virus that is killing people. Everyone was petrified. And, my, and then I realized my job was to, in, to install confidence in people, to get them to get back to work and feel like that they were protected and that we were, you know, doing our, the, the, our utmost to protect them. Um, and then, you know, it was a three-day shoot and then people started to, kind of getting to the swing of it. You know, the masks are very uncomfortable to start with. I have a safety briefing every morning, which was my opportunity to share my knowledge, but also make people, you know, install confidence in people to, so that they, they could comfortably do their job. Um, and then, so I start, and then I got together with, uh, just right before this, I got together, together with a friend of mine in New York, uh, Helena Brown, who was also looking to pivot into something. And she comes from the ad, ad world. And her and I were talking and we're like, you know, there's a business in this. Like people need really good people because there were a lot of people out there that had just done a two hour course. And all of a sudden they were like, Hey, I'm a compliance officer. And mm -hmm. a lot of productions were, were very disappointed 
with what was happening. You know, they didn't they didn't have the respect of the crew. You know, people were fucking around. Like, you know, uh, they were found people crying in cars. You know, like it was just overwhelming for the first two months for a lot of people. So we were like, let's train people up. So we started training um, people up in in uh, as COVID compliance officers with the knowledge that I had. We, we had a criteria that anybody that does this must have had at least five years on set experience because they need to know their way around a set. They need to know the flow. They need to know set etiquette. They need to know who does what. Um, they need to know how to talk on a walkie-talkie. You know, so we thought that this was a really important uh, uh, component to be in a COVID compliance officer, along with a training. So we decided we put all of our officers on a strict training course of at least 60 hours of health and safety. So that it's not just these two courses that are out there anymore. There's like knowing what the infection is. You know, um, the World Health and I, uh, the World Health Organization have courses. Uh, OSHA have courses. There are all these courses that we, so we put people on 60 hours of training and now we've kind of, I'm taking a bit more of a backseat in a run, uh, being there on the sets, but running the back end with Helena and, um, you know, with the business and training up the officers and bidding the jobs. Wow. And that, I I, I imagine that's something even post COVID that would develop in just terms of you know, general health looking after a set, which is probably something that's been really am- amiss, remiss right. and amiss in, 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 in general life. I mean, people, people have been filthy, things haven't been cleaned properly, the spread of colds and flus and viruses in general. You know, I it- had a friend that was on a shoot on an independent movie and it, they were shooting in an abandoned warehouse um, up in uh, Carlsbad. And he said he got there and... You know, they're shooting at night and the the director's like having him crawl along this sawdusty floor. And he's like, there's rat droppings and there's, you know, poo and like cow, dried cow dunk and stuff. And it's all real. Like normally if you're on a movie, like the props people will replace that with clean dirt. Right. Uh, to recreate it. But shooting this independent the director didn't care, mm-hmm. you know, about the health and safety of that actor. And so that bothered me. And I'm like, you know what? Th- that Yes, this position does need to exist and should be mandated on all sets for the health and safety of the crew and the casts that, um, you know, are on various productions. Because as we know, there have been cases where, you know, people have died on sets, you know, not not stunt guys or stunts gone wrong, let alone that, but crew members that have gone on a train track and, you know, someone said, oh, yeah, it's safe, go on that train track, and a train comes and, you know, kills them. Or, yeah, yeah, just hang that off of that cliff there. You'll be fine, you'll be fine. You know, the, the branch snaps and the person falls down, mm-hmm. you know, the side of a cliff. And it, it, if there's a safety, health and safety person on set that is a part of that conversation, that would never have happened. Right, right. Well, yeah. So yeah, I do believe that there is there is space and room and a need for the, this position going forward. So, and and in that training now, do you how do you feel about the the disease going forward? I mean, that I sense that you know there is COVID frustration now. It's fatigue, COVID fatigue, as as we're calling it. And but there is definitely a sense that we kind of understand things a bit better. And, you know, there is a way forward to exist with it. And hopefully that existing will become better and less um, stringent and less uh, less of an ability to actually exist as normal. Do you see a, do you see the, the positive coming? Can you see the, the light um, in the tunnel at all? A silver lining? Uh I mean, I think, you know, once the vaccine arrives and depending upon how strong or how effective that vaccine is, depends upon how we live. I think that it's been a great lesson for us. And if you see how some of the um, countries in the you know, Far East have dealt with 
uh, how they dealt with SARS and MERS and what they learned from that and taking it into COVID-19 that they've changed their behavior Mm -hmm. accordingly and that there's been less deaths there because they knew what to do right away. Yeah. Well, there was a plan in action. Uh, and I think that, you know, I know for me, and I can only speak for me and the people that I know, that, you know, it, it was always funny when we'd see, uh, you know, tourist, Asian tourists coming to California and wearing their masks on a, or on a plane or on public transportation. And it's like, oh, my God, look at them, you know, like germaphobes. But... In actual fact, they were protecting their health. And I think, you know, like I, I don't think I'll go anywhere without hand sanitizer anymore. You know, it's on my key ring. You know, it's like it's now kind of being ingrained in my life how to be, how to take care of myself, how to be healthier. And I think that's something that we'll all carry with us a little bit. And, you know, if I'm on a plane, I'm going to take a mask with me, you know, and I don't, I don't think there's any shame in that anymore. I think that, you know, we're also used to now seeing everybody walking around with masks. A lot of people incorrectly, though, I may add. Um, It doesn't go around your chin, folks. It goes above the nose. (laughs) Um, Actually, I have an example right here. Oh, my God. Here we go. (laughs) So always hold it by the ear loops. Place it on the top of the nose, around the ear loops. Pinch and pull. Yay! Simple. What an improvement. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's the thing, isn't it, Paul? I, I mean, how do you do it? It's a single man going out and they're dating in the mass society and they take this off and it's a horror. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, we, we, I just want to finish off, actually, with uh, something a bit more cheerful as well. Um, Mank is coming out. Yes. And uh, that's the David Fincher film. <laughs> With you as Charlie Chaplin, which is amazing. Have you had a chance to see any of it yet? I have not, no. I've only seen the trailer. Okay. Um, and, you know, let's preface this by, you know, it's it's not a huge role. It's not anything to do with Charlie Chaplin. He's just one of the characters that happen to be in the film. And it's Charlie in his real life as opposed to the, the camp, Charlie. Right, the right. Um, but, yeah, it was... Uh, it was interesting in terms of that it was freaking amazing and scary you know to be on this huge set with you know Gary Oldman and Charles Dance and Amanda Seyfried and you know what I mean to just kind of be around these you know A-list actors um, that were so down to earth and so wonderful and so lovely and then also on the other side of that with, you know, Mr. Fincher himself, who, you know, as we know, is just is a genius in his own right. And um, but, yeah, he's he's he could. And you, we've all heard horror stories about how Fincher works, you know, like he's takes after takes after takes after takes. And that is true. But um, uh but I was like, can I stay longer? Like, you know what I mean? I didn't, I, I didn't want to leave the set. It was like, it became home. Um, and it was definitely a pinch, you know, I had to pinch myself many times during it just to make sure that, you know, that little kid from Nottingham, age 10, was actually in a Hollywood movie. Mm-hmm. You know, that, no matter how big or small, just that feat itself to you know, to go back to, if I could go back to that little 10 year old kid stepping for the first time in, you know, on stage and going, one day, kid, you're going to be in Hollywood. <laughs> I would have laughed at him, you know, this old bleach blonde old motherfucker coming, <laughs> coming from the future. <laughs> um, Craig, thanks so much for doing this. Um, Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's really lovely. It's nice to see you without your mask on. To see you nice. And uh, I shall see you again in 2030. <laughs> <laughs> when we'll be older and much wiser. <laughs> much wiser. We'll definitely be wiser. And drunker, hopefully. So thank you, Craig Robert Young. It's been a pleasure, and thanks for being on the Magic of Podcast. <laughs>